Ladies and gentlemen, um, a special welcome to this uh, second Vrienden van Kopenhagen lecture. It's a great honor uh, to have you all here. A special welcome, of course, to onze vrienden, our students, because they, they are the most important persons in this room, because they will determine our next generation, and other special guests, our keynote speaker, and of course our panel members. Special welcome to this uh, afternoon here in Tilburg, and we are very pleased that you are here in that large number of guests. And we hope we can offer you a very interesting program this afternoon. Before I go into a in further introduction, introduction update of the Vrienden, um, I just want to show you one thing. This is, uh, well, it's famous Belgium chocolates. I won't explain it to you, but what I'd like to show you is just this. Why I'm showing this this, because with this I will come to why we think this afternoon will be very important to all of us. Maybe one of the most important subjects for the coming years to, to discover. Um, I'm normally in my day-to-day -day life, I own a large Dutch technology company and I, at my annual Christmas dinner with management, I gave them two things. One is a book of our keynote speaker, but I leave that to, uh, to you, not to me. And the other thing I, show, I have given them this, why? They are all around 40 years old, some are 45 years old, and this is a robot. We won't go into a robot this afternoon, but this robot, it has a camera in it, it can speak, it can react on my voice, um, I can teach it, I can demonstrate it with my iPhone, can control it from a large distance, and it keeps all my data and it brings data to some place in the world where I don't know what happens. <laughs> and I told my management, please, this is, very, this is probably one of the most crucial developments in the coming years, we have to deal with it. Um, why I'm showing this is because I think this is exactly, um, oh, I can turn it off. That's still, <laughs> that's still the interesting part. Um, this is exactly the subject I think we will deal this afternoon because this small robot, and you can buy it for 80 euro at uh, Intertoys. My management and myself took it a half day to get it in control when you give it to a five-year-old child within 20 minutes, it has more control than whoever will get it in this room. Uh, but it generates, it, it stimulates or it explains probably where we are heading to, towards a digital or digital society and everything related to that. And for that reason, we are very pleased to have this program this afternoon and to have a very distinguished keynote speaker which gives a very broad view, I think, about this subject and leaves us with a lot of questions, probably, and also with a lot of panel members which can have this discussion. So, once again, welcome, and we hope that you will have a very pleasant and interesting uh, afternoon, and it all brings us something to, uh, well, our own mind. Well, before we uh, go into the real program, I'd like to take a few minutes to explain why we want to have this lecture. Because, um, and I will, I will turn into Dutch, if you will forgive me. Uh, the, the slides are in English, because dit is oorspronkelijk voortgekomen, deze bijeenkomst natuurlijk vanuit de Vrienden van Kopenhagen. En voor degenen in de zaal die dat niet weten, de Vrienden van Kopenhagen is een groep van zeer betrokken alumni van deze universiteit, die de universiteit met raad en daad terzijde staan. Er zijn ook een aantal alumni hier aanwezig die... Uh, voor ons nog geen vriend zijn en uh, wij zijn heel blij dat u hier aanwezig bent en we hopen natuurlijk ook mede door deze programma vanmiddag dat u uh, onverhoopt een van ons aanschiet en onmiddellijk een handtekening zet, liefst Blanco, om vriend te worden. We zullen het niet uh, uh, mistrust uh, toepassen, want wij vinden het heel belangrijk vanuit alumni dat wij een grote verbondenheid houden, dat hebben we altijd gehad, maar ook naar toekomst met de universiteit. En onder andere deze lecture is daar een middel toe om ons te demonstreren. Hè? De brug te slaan tussen studenten, maatschappelijke thema's en vanuit alumni. Dat brengt ons iets als alumni, maar het brengt ook iets naar studenten en iets naar de universiteit. En daarom vinden we het heel prettig om deze opzet te hebben. Het is de tweede keer en we hopen iedere keer het weer verder te kunnen verrijken. Mag ik de volgende slide? 
Um, nou, wat ik al zei, er zijn een twintigtal gasten hier die nog wel alumni zijn, maar nog geen vriend. En speciaal welkom, vanzelfsprekend, los van natuurlijk de vrienden en studenten en andere gasten. We hopen dat jullie inderdaad vriend willen worden en de universiteit en de betrokkenheid met elkaar alleen maar willen vergroten. Nou, misschien toch ook nog even voordat ik echt naar het programma ga, een kleine update. Uh, we bestaan 25 jaar uh, en we zullen dat vieren op 1 juni aanstaande met partners voor de vrienden. Noteer het alvast in de agenda. Het wordt denk ik een heel boeiend, interessant programma. Het thema is generaties, zeer actueel en we willen een heel interactief, leuk, ontspannen programma. Eind van de middag op vrijdag met de avond met alle ingrediënten denk ik die ouderen... Uh, minder oudere en jongere alumni zullen boeien. En ik, uh, ik ben ervan overtuigd dat we dan een hele mooie lustrum hebben en dat we met z'n allen stil kunnen staan bij het feit dat wij uh, het enige instituut in Nederland die zoiets heeft, de enige universiteit die iets heeft zoals alle de vrienden van Kopenhagen. En daar willen we speciaal bij stilstaan. We hebben recent ook een oproep gedaan voor een aantal nieuwe bestuursleden, uh, omdat er een aantal van ons, inclusief mijzelf, ja, de termijn zit er op een gegeven moment op. En dat moet je ook terugtreden. En we zijn heel blij dat er eh, grote aantallen hebben gereageerd van vrienden die graag lid van het bestuur willen worden. En we hopen op hele korte termijn daar een definitief een besluit over te kunnen nemen en dat ook te kunnen communiceren. Dus eh, bij deze alvast dat we eh, daarmee ook de continuïteit, eh, eh, in ieder geval voor het bestuur, maar ook voor in ieder geval de vrienden hopelijk weer veilig hebben gesteld. Want dat hoort er ook bij. Dan nog een aantal andere activiteiten, een aantal zogenaamde boardroom meetings. Dat zijn eigenlijk kleinschalige bijeenkomsten van vrienden, vooral voor andere vrienden, om eens een keer van gedachten te wisselen over diverse onderwerpen. Wat ze in het werk bezighoudt of andere maatschappelijke thema's. En in, u ziet er iets, Huub Dekkers zal in 1 maart een boardroom meeting geven. Wouter Schepen zal 17 mei een boardroom meeting geven. En we willen in het najaar een boardroom mee, uh, organiseren met uh, professor Marcel Poorthuis over zijn recent verschenen publicatie over de ja, Managing with Moses. Zeer inspirerend, kan ik iedereen aanraden om te lezen. En natuurlijk, vraag ik nogmaals, we gaan naar een digitale sociëteit, maatschappij bedoel ik, dan is het ook heel belangrijk dat wij daar maar gewoon de stap nemen. We hebben al een paar jaar een app, en apps zijn in, en we doen ons dringend beroep om je vooral te registreren als je dat nog niet gedaan hebt in de app, want dat maakt communicatie en informatie delen alleen nog maar makkelijker. Los van het onderwerp de rest van de middag. Nou, I will switch to English. Because uh, giving you this update about the friends of Copenhagen. I especially like to, uh, to introduce the program further. And then I give the floor to Professor Dick Den Hertog. Who further introduced the, the theme of this afternoon. And also give an introduction to our keynote speaker. Uh, but it's a simple program. We have an introduction by Professor Dignan Hertog. Then we have a keynote speech by Professor Victor Maria Schoenberger. And then we like to have an interactive panel discussion. So we really challenge you to come up with questions with our panel and with the, our keynote speakers, because I think that's one of the elements of this afternoon that we get interaction and that we get uh, some kind of academic and practical discussion about this important theme. And then we come back to you because we also like to award our so-called scholarships prizes, which we have uh, 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 introduced uh, last year. But I will introduce that further to you later in the program. So I now like to give the floor to Professor Dignan Hertog to give a further introduction to uh, this theme of this afternoon and an introduction to our keynote speaker. Thank you and have a pleasant afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Dick Ten Hertog, Professor of Business Analytics, Operational Research at this university, and also Scientific Director of the Data Science Center, Tilburg. In this short introduction, I would like to introduce the topic of today, but more importantly, also the speaker of today. So the title of this conference is Two Words, a digital society. And to be honest, I think we're already living in such a digital society, but I agree that the society will certainly become more and more digital in the future. The developments in this respect are enormous. Many countries now start or have started big initiatives on the topic of data 
and algorithms. I just mentioned here some very recent or recent news. One news item, China is building a $2.1 billion industrial park for artificial intelligence research. The United Arab Emirates is the first nation with a government minister dedicated to AI, artificial intelligence. Another news item, artificial intelligence can diagnose heart disease and lung cancer more accurately than doctors. Bill Gates purchased an enormous amount of land to build his own smart city, um, and it's almost 25,000 acres of land in Arizona. But data science is also an important topic for the Tilburg University. Several years ago, we started a joint data initiative together with Eindhoven University of Technology, which is now called JETS, the Rodemus Academy of Data Science. JETS is located at three locations, Eindhoven, Tilburg, but also an important part in the monastery Marienburg in Setogenbos. And moreover, Tilburg University recently started what is called the Impact Program, to really use science to have impact in our society, to make this world a better place. Science with a soul, as we call it. And one of the three impact themes is creating value from data. And personally, I strongly believe that data science can be used to improve the world a little bit. I'm convinced that Martinus Copenhagen, the founder of this university, and also the lecture is called, eh, the Copenhagen lecture, that he would agree with me to use data science for this purpose. In this respect, I cannot resist the temptation to shortly mention one of the data science projects I'm personally involved. Using data and algorithms, we were able to optimize the food supply chain for the World Food Program of the United Nations. This has been applied to countries as Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and now also to the countries that suffer from the effects of El Nino. And due to these data science techniques, World Food Program could feed one million more people in Syria. Yes, a digital world can be a better world, but not necessarily. I also refer to the book Weapons of Math Destruction, written by Katie O'Neill, but also to several interviews. For example, the interview with Stephen Hawking. And he's saying, I fear that artificial intelligence may replace humans altogether. Elon Musk, who claims that we only have a 10% chance of making AI safe. The role of data in our society and economy is exactly the topic of the Copenhagen lecture of today. And I think our keynote speaker is the most ideal person to talk about this topic. And also at this point, I would like to announce already the topic of the fifth Copenhagen summit on March the 5th. And the topic of uh, that summit is artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and a big honor to introduce the speaker of today, Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger. Many of you do know him from his book, Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think, 2013. This book has also been translated into Dutch, and I think it's a bad translation, to be honest. Um, the Dutch translation is, the Big Data Revolutie, hoe de data-explosie al onze vragen gaat beantwoorden. So, Victor, um, do you understand Dutch? Enough. Enough? So, do you really think, but maybe you can also come to that in your talk, do you really think that this is true, that the data explosion will answer all our questions? We'll see. But I think he wrote also other books. Um, another book that I also like is the book uh, Delete, The Virtue of Forgetting in the Digital Age. So Victor is the professor of internet governance and regulation at Oxford. 
And earlier, he spent 10 years on the faculty of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He has co-authored 11 books. You know, I'm writing a book now, and it took me already seven, no, five years, and still not finished, so. <laughs> and his recent book is Reinventing Capitalism in the Age of Big Data. I think we will hear more about it today. And he's also the author of more than 100 articles on the economics and governance of information. He studied in Salzburg, Harvard, London School of Economics, but he's also an entrepreneur. So in 1986, he started, he founded Icare Software, which became the best-selling Austrian software product. And he was voted the top five software entrepreneur in Austria in 1991. And in 2014, he received a World Technology Award in the law category for his work. He's a frequent public speaker, so interviews and articles on uh, Victor and his work can be found in, example given, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Economist, Nature Science, and last week was also an interview with Victor on the Dutch television in Buitenhof, and also interviews with him in Financial Dagblad, NAC, Algemeen Dagblad. Victor was also the keynote speaker at the opening of the Hieronymus Academy of Data Science in Bosch in 2016. And during that event, Queen Maxima performed the official opening of JETS. And I still remember that the audience was very enthusiastic about your talks. So, Victor, the expe expectations for today are sky high. <laughs> Thank you. So, may I invite you to deliver your speech? Thank you very much. Oh boy. <laughs> what will I tell my wife tonight? Um, oops, let me see. <coughs> ah, now better. Thank you very much, uh, Dick. I come here uh, with incredible delight. I'm deeply honored to be here this afternoon and to speak to you, but also to engage. I have had the tremendous fortune in my life of being able to teach at Harvard and at Oxford, uh, and that's pretty much winning the lottery if you're an academic. Um, but I. I must say, and you may not know it completely, but when, when I want inspiration, when I want to find out what's the next new idea, when I want to be inspired in my own research, I make sure that on SSRN, that's the Social Science Research Network, I read what comes out of Tilburg University. And so, I've been a friend of Tilburg University for quite some time, and I, every time I come back here, I am inspired again, and I learn. I, don't, can't, I can't say that of all academic conferences. So today, I have had a chance to meet uh, with some of you, but also with my dear friend Dick and with Sylvester, and just listening to them over the course of lunch taught me so much, and I was able to learn so much that for me this trip has already paid off. So now I need to do the work to actually make this. So with that in mind, let's talk about the, the data society, as I call this. And a lot of people out there think that this digital, this data society is all about speed. It's all about doing what we're already doing, but just doing it faster. Doing it at breakneck speed and perhaps more efficiently. I have a very different view of what this new age is all about. My view is not that it's faster, although it may be faster, but that what the data revolution does to us is 
that it opens up a new perspective on reality. It gives us a new look at the world and how it is. And so that we, we see the world more precisely, better, perhaps differently, than we saw it before. And with that in mind, with that knowledge in mind, we can improve as we inform our decision-making. Because that's, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, what much of our life is all about, making decisions. Going left or right, A or B. And when we do this, we can rely on our gut reaction on which way we got up this morning when we get out of bed. We can rely on pure belief. Or we can rely on facts. We can rely on thinking and putting those facts into a perspective. Here in this country, in the Netherlands, you have a long and proud tradition of enlightenment. And to me, in a way, the big data revolution and the data age is about taking the ideas of enlightenment into the next century. The ideas that more knowledge is better than less knowledge, that understanding the world helps us make better decisions, not just about ourselves or about making money, but about how to help the common good, how to improve society and the plight of people all around the world. Now, you'd say, but wait a minute, Meyer Schoenberger, haven't we done that all along? using data and facts to inform ourselves and to understand? Yes, you're right. Since the very beginning of time, we have looked at the world, observed it, and then analyzed the data that we gain from it, the facts that we learn from it, in order to understand the world. But you know what? All throughout time, we also knew that collecting such data and analyzing it was hard and difficult and time-consuming. And so what we did was that we collected as little as we absolutely needed, squeezed it out in order to get the insights that we wanted because we feared we would never have enough data. We accepted that we live in a world of small data and we designed our methods and our ways of understanding the world so that we could use the least amount of data to have the biggest impact. But what if that changes? What if our ability to collect and analyze data changes? Well, then we need to rethink, perhaps, the approach and the process by which we make sense of the world we live in. It's a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, if I want to make a connection to or a metaphor like photography. Think about it. If you take a picture of a rider on a horse, what you have is a picture of a rider on a horse. But let's improve the quantity. Let's take a picture every second of a rider on a horse. What do we then have? More pictures of a rider on a horse. But let's increase the quantity even further. Let's do 16 pictures per second of a rider on a horse. Then what happens then? Then the quantity of additional information translates into a new quality. And that is the hope, that is the promise of the data age, that is the promise of digitization, that the quantity translates into a quality, into a quality of insight and improved decision-making in the world. Now, as we do this, we also must understand how we have advanced in academia as well as beyond it. See, we humans always have used data, I mentioned that, but in a particular a place in the process of understanding the world. See, we begin with a question. The question comes from us, a concrete hypothesis, as the academics call it. Then we go out and collect data and analyze it in order to tell us whether the hypothesis was right or was wrong. And that has helped us, advanced us. But you know what? That progress was fraught with difficulty, setbacks, detours, dead ends. Why? Because it all hinges upon our ability to ask the right question. 
Are we always asking the right question? Are we always coming up with the right hypothesis that we then need the data to just show that we are right or not? Maybe, but maybe not. And the promise of the data age is that we can actually change the process. That is, that we can begin with the data and the analysis in order to drive hypothesis, to help us look at hypothesis that we, we, we didn't think before of. Now, let me give you an example on how this plays out. And this example has to do with a, a group of human beings that are particularly vulnerable. A group of human beings like this one, a prematurely born baby. Prematurely born babies are disproportionately more afflicted with deadly infections than ordinary babies, and these infections are discovered too late. So more prematurely born babies die of infections that are discovered too late. Dr. Carolyn McGregor and her team at the, uh, at the uh, university outside of Toronto had a idea how they could help these prematurely born babies, and it has to do with data. So what did they do? They attached sensors to these babies to capture the vital signs of the baby in real time, like blood oxygenation level, heart rate, blood pressure, and so on. They did this and they collected 1,200 vital sign data points per baby, per second. And they did this over days and weeks and months and over dozens and dozens of babies. And then they said, you know what? We don't know exactly what we are looking for. But what we are looking for more generally is a pattern in the vital signs that would predict with a high degree of likelihood the later onset of an infection. We have no concrete hypothesis how this pattern looks like at this point in time. But maybe we can find the pattern. And they found it doing big data analysis. So today, just by looking at the change of the vital signs, they can discover with high degree of likelihood if a prematurely born baby will have an infection 24 hours before first symptoms manifest themselves. And that means being able to give medication earlier and save babies' lives. When, I, when we interviewed Dr. Carolyn McGregor for our book, Big Data, we asked her, so, Caroline, what's the pattern? What's the pattern? Tell us, what's the pattern? And she laughed and she said, you know, you would think that the pattern that indicates a later infection is when the vital signs go crazy. But we discovered that the pattern of a later infection is when from one second to the other, the vital signs stabilize. Which pediatrician would have come up with the hypothesis that when one second to the other, the vital signs of a prematurely born baby stabilize 24 hours later, you have a likely infection. This is the kind of unintuitive, counterintuitive insight that we can get out of data analysis and looking at new patterns. Dr. Carol McGregor, the star of my story here, the savior of thousands of babies, Dr. Carolyn McGregor, Dr. Carolyn McGregor, not a medical doctor, computer scientist. That's the age of a data-driven machine learning where we are learning from what is happening out there. And you've already seen, every one of you, I'm sure, the Google self-driving car. It looks a little funny and so forth, I understand. But what is important about it is how it learns to drive. See, if you, if you compare the Google self-driving car with self-driving cars of any of the large European car manufacturers, here is what you see. This is a distance in kilometers to the next human intervention. So when a human needs to intervene as the car is driving itself, and this is by the end data from the end of 2015. So when you have the average car producer, then the car can go about 400 kilometers before a human needs to intervene. 
at the same time the Google self-driving car could go 2,000 kilometers, but five times better. Why? Why is Google so much better? Because a typical car manufacturer in Europe has a given budget for the sensors that they put in the car. And they say, we'll spend 5,000 euros on the sensors. So we economize on the sensors. And therefore, we reduce the amount of data. Well, Google says, we optimize on innovation. We don't optimize on cost. So we put lots of sensors in there, get lots of data. In fact, a Google self-driving car analyzes and gathers a billion data points a second when it self-drives. And so, therefore, does it much better. Now, because you have so much data and because you gather this data and then you do an analysis over and over again, your advantage continues to grow. When the car manufacturer realized what I just told you, they put a couple of more sensors in the cars. And you know what? A year later, their self-driving cars had improved by 30%. An amazing improvement year over year. But let's look at what the Google car did. <laughs> Google at the end of 2015, about 2,000 kilometers before human intervention. Just one year later, because of lots of data to learn from, 8,000 kilometers. So were the car manufacturers improved by 30%, Google improved by 400%. That's data-driven innovation at work data-driven machine learning. And the interesting thing isn't the self-driving, funny-looking Google car. The interesting thing is that when we have cars that drive themselves, we don't need to own them anymore. See, I have a car that I only use 4% of the time. Why can't I give my car to somebody else to drive it while I am at work? You know why, Dick? Because you don't drive as well as I do. And so I would never entrust my beautiful car with you. But guess if the car is self-driving. It doesn't matter whether I sit in the back or Dick is sitting in the back. It doesn't matter because it's the same self-driving algorithm. And so, therefore, we could share cars rather than possess them. And my colleagues at the London School of Economics have shown that this would free up 25 to 30 percent of space used now for streets and parking in metropolitan areas. Can you imagine what this does in a society like yours? <coughs> or think about medical uh, advances. We are, when I have a cold, I am taking an aspirin. And the aspirin was designed for an average cold by an average male. You know what? I'm not an average male. And certainly my cold is never an average cold. Much worse than that. <laughs> so when I take that dosage of aspirin, I over or underdose. Why don't I get the right dosage? Because my doctor doesn't have the data. The data about my metabolism, about my illness. If we could be more precise about that, we could improve not just efficiencies in the healthcare system, but we could improve life quality in the healthcare system at lower cost. Or think about education. My son is almost eight years old. He's going to a great elementary school. I couldn't be happier, but the truth is that all of the kids in the class that he has are taught the same way. But humans aren't the same. We have different ways to understand the world. We have different ways to understand mathematics or, or, or languages. Why are we using one particular pedagogical approach only? Because we don't have the data. And when we have the data and we can analyze it, we can get better and not just become a new Harvard. That doesn't do much of taking students and taking pupils in schools and enabling them to reach their individual potential because that's really what educational institutions should be all about. Now, let's think about that one big part of our lives. That's the economy. How is the economy changing and amending because of that data age? When we think about 
markets, when we have a picture of markets, we know what a market is. A market's a great place to coordinate and to work with each other and to get what you want. But in a market, you need to know a lot in order to make a good decision. So you need to have a lot of information and then transfer that information into decisions. In a small village market, you can do that, but in global markets, you can never do that. And therefore, we came up with a shortcut hundreds of years ago on how to ensure, ensure that on markets we have enough information to make decisions. And that shortcut was that we would take all of our preferences and all of a product's qualities and condense them into one number. Price. Through price, how much we're willing to pay, how much we want for a product, we communicate in markets. It's extremely efficient. I only need to say a number that can easily be compared, and then we know whether we have a transaction or not. But you know what? As we do this, it also causes difficulties. But through price, we communicate, and of course, money is the medium of communication to communicate in price. So traditional markets work because money and price inform us, and they help us decide. But when we look more closer, we understand that, of course, that's not so good a solution. Through the condensation into one single figure, a lot of details gets lost, and we humans have difficulties comparing lots of different qualities, including price, and making a decision. Think about just choosing from different sets of strawberries. Are you going just for the cheapest or compare the cheapest with the color of the strawberry and then with the origin and then maybe whether or not it was biologically harvested or not? If we have markets that could be rich in data, that where we had data beyond just price, we could improve buying and selling, we could improve the, the fit between transaction partners. And that's precisely what is happening. Think about how my parents made a choice on where to go for holidays. We would look at the catalog like this. We would know that all the photos were <laughs> fake. And all of the language was done by marketing. And so we would look through the lines, <laughs> trying to decipher what this means. Like if it said, a stunning perspective from the hotel, it meant that the hotel wasn't at the beach, um, and these type of things. And then once we made a decision, we would go there. If it wasn't too bad a hotel, we would come there the next year because the risk of making a bad choice next year was much too high. Compared it to how we are booking hotels today, I do, my students do. We go to a booking platform, we look through, we select what exactly we want, where we want to be, we then look at the reviews, we look at the pictures that were taken, not by marketing photographers, but by actually guests in the hotel. We go to Google Street View and look around, and then we make a choice. The choice isn't primarily informed just by price anymore. It has a lot of other components that are factored into it. These are data-rich markets that we have. And this is not about just hotels. There's a startup company called Blah Blah Car. Do you know them? Who has a, a, a ride-sharing company? Who has done rides with them? Yes, some of you, great. They do 30 million rides a month uh, around the world. Now, if you try to select a rider and a, a driver that's going the way anyway, then Price isn't a huge factor in the selection process. But other factors, like how talkative the driver and the rider are. Blah, or blah, blah, or blah, blah, blah. And you know, whoever has driven with somebody who is very talkative when you want to be silent for three hours <laughs> knows how good that is in the market of ride-sharing. This is the kind of data-rich markets that we are looking at. And what helps us in these data-rich markets is diverse data beyond price. But if we don't want to spend an hour or two trying to find the right transaction partners, we also need that other thing that is data-driven learning decision assistance. And we have them 
they're slowly coming online. You know that sort of Alexis and series of the world. They're not good yet, but they're getting better and better quite fast. So the hope is that with data-rich markets, we can actually use data to inform us and not money. But that will have huge consequences for institutions of money. Look at the banks and their marble palaces. Take a good look because in 10, 20 years, they may not be around anymore in the way we use them. Money will still be important as a, as a method of payment. Of course, we need to pay. But that's a commodity function. That's something that you can produce relatively cheaply. The other function of money and price has been to inform us in the market. And if that is being at least in part replaced by data, the banks lose some of their fundamental value proposition. But it's not just the banks that need to think about themselves, it's also the firm. Because the firm, of course, works with the market, but it's also a competitor of the market. Oops! What do I mean by that? See, when we want to organize and coordinate human activity, we can do it through the market, or we can do it through an organization, a more hierarchical organization called the firm. Almost 100 years ago, Ronald Coase said that we have the firm because there are certain things that we cannot do as cheaply on the market. And if we can do it more cheaply in the firm, we should. But what if the market becomes really cheap because we have better transactions? then the firm will become less important as a vehicle of coordinating human labor. It may still be an important vehicle of capturing profit in the legal sense, but that's a different thing. Now, you come back to me now and say, but Meyer Schoenberger, <sighs> I understand what you're saying, but, but this is a bit crazy here because... They're superstar firms now, like Google and Apple and Amazon and Facebook. How can you say that the firm is getting less and less important? And you're right. There are these superstar firms, and we could add more to them. But think about what they're doing. Are they large organizations where people work together? Not so much. What are they? They're data-rich markets. Amazon is a data-rich market of products. Google is a data-rich market for advertisements. So is Facebook. Apple is a data-rich market in its app store for apps, in its music store for music, in its content and video and TV store for content. And Airbnb is a data-rich market, of course, for accommodation. And we can add to that. So they prove my point. Data-rich markets win, but they also lead to huge concentrations of information power. We are rightly worried about the size of them, but we should be even more worried because they have so much data. And in, in some ways, this is worrying because that gives them an enormous innovative power. But there is another problem with it, and that is if we have only a few of those players out there, then that's also a single point of failure. If we trust Alexa with all of our buying decisions, but Alexa has a problem and therefore gives us the wrong decision suggestion, then we all make the same mistake, which undermines the fundamental quality that makes the market so advanced and robust. It's the resilience that is being driven from decentralized decision-making. If that goes away because we have basically a centralized decision assistant, then we have a single point of failure. It's much like discovering that your car has a faulty brake and all other cars have the same faulty brake too. And so we need to do something about that. And and we need to ensure that we have diversity of these decision assistants. And in the book that I just published in Dutch this week, <laughs> The Data Economy, we suggest a progressive data sharing mandate. Uh, and that is a mandate for large corporations. The larger they get, the more data they have to share with smaller players in the market to ensure that there is competition. 
I need to talk about one more important element about the story, and this is an important element that has to do with the distribution of wealth and the inequal distribution of wealth. Um, Mr. Piketty has written a very impressive book a couple of years ago about the inequality of our economic system. And the one central argument that he used was to show that the labor share, that is how much of the money of the, general, of the GDP, of the gross domestic product, is dedicated to paying employees how that labor share over time has become less and less in our society. And this is basically the development of labor share. Now, I am following here a lead of Sylvester, who has worked in this and talked about this, Sylvester Afinger, who has worked on this before. Uh, and so uh, my apologies for repeating something. But it, it is crucially important. Labor share has reduced. We pay less for employment throughout the world, in the United States, but in many other countries as well. And so the argument that Piketty made was laborers lose, but the capital is gaining. But there is new work just coming out over the last year or two, including by a wonderfully young new scholar called Simcha Barkay, um, who has shown that that's not right. I'll show you now the calculation of capital share. That is how much of gross domestic product goes to capital, paying interest, for example, and how that decreased over the years. Oh, no. Laborers have lost, but capitalists have lost even more. Ha, you say. But then the question is, who gained? Where is the money going? Is it all going to Russian off offshore accounts? Well, actually not. Here is where it's going. Profit share is way up. That is, a small number of companies makes a grandiosely disproportionate amount of profit. And you know who those companies are? The same superstars that I just mentioned earlier. And so, what are the consequences of this? Consequence number one is that we need to tax them more effectively. We're talking about that. Consequence number two is I got it right. My theory about data-rich markets is right because it just proves it. Ha! <laughs> but thirdly, if labor share goes down and capital share goes down, there is an irony in that. That is, Apple makes a lot of money, but once they have made the money, they can't do much with it. Because when they invest it as capital, it doesn't give them much of a return. So they have a money printing machine, but then they burn the money at the end by not investing it with a high return. This is not sustainable. It points towards a market that has lost its competitive force, and we need to bring that competitive edge back to the market so that we can have more and better equity as well. And we need to think about unbundling work, as work becomes not just less but different. Perhaps we need to pair it with a partial universal basic income. There is one more element. A lot of people are worried about data and its use. And we need to look at how we can instill trust, trust that the data is used appropriately. We can only do that, I believe, if we create responsibility of those that use the data. And trust and responsibility, to me, are the currency of big data sustainability. If we don't have that, we cannot have a sustainable data age. Now, I come to the conclusion a big data analysis in the United States found out that colors of the color of the uh, cars of the color orange have the least repair costs. Stop. Stop, you guys. Stop, 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 stop. Half of you are already thinking in your mind, why is this the case? Is it because an orange car is more visible at night? Is it because an orange colored car is specially manufactured? Is it because an orange car driver is a better driver? Stop. 
no causality in this. This is correlation, as statisticians tell us. And the biggest problem for us humans is that we imbue and give meaning to data that it doesn't have. That we don't understand not just what it means, but also what it doesn't mean. It's inherent limitations. The problem isn't the data, the problem is us. So what's next, ladies and gentlemen? As we go ahead and learn to harness the technology, we must make sure that we remain in charge. That just as there is a vital need to learn from the data, there is also a need to carve out a space for the human, for what isn't so easily captured in data, for what doesn't show up for our originality, creativity, for our irrationality, for sometimes having the freedom to not do what the data analysis says. Because at the end of the day, the data is always just a shadow of reality and therefore always a little bit imperfect and a little bit incomplete. So it behooves me and everybody to remember here in Tilburg University in particular that we are human and that there is more than just data. There needs something beyond that that needs to guide us and that needs to point us in the right direction. Because as much as we need to learn from the data, we need to do so with a great portion of humility and an equally great portion of humanity. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Watch this. <clears throat> well, we have now the next part. And that's a panel discussion, or as Oswald put it, an interactive panel discussion. We do our best to make it interactive as possible. Um, Victor, you promised me a dazzling presentation. You kept your promise. It was a dazzling. <laughs> dazzling. And, of course, after this dazzling presentation, we try to have this dazzling interactive panel uh, session. And first I ask Dick den Hertog also to come forward uh, to take part in the panel. And you may choose your own place, what you want. <laughs> oh, it's not pre-selected, so it's just at random. Uh, then I ask Claudia Menem also to come forward to take her place at the panel session. And, of course, my dear colleague Corinne Prins. Corinne, please. Of course, I don't have to introduce Victor and Dick anymore, but I should introduce both Corinne and Claudia. Uh, let me first start with Corinne. Corinne is, of course, a dear colleague of mine who uh, works here for many years. I don't know who works longer, uh, but Nine we know each other for... Yes, yeah, sorry? 1994, Professor. I, well, well, it's almost comparable. Yeah. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> almost. A little bit more years, but it doesn't matter so much in this perspective. And Corinne is now the chairman of the Scientific Council for Government Policy, a very prestigious body in The Hague, which advises the government and has real influence on government policies. She's the first woman who occupies this ch prestigious chair of the WR, the Scientific Council of uh, Government Policy. So first, applause. <laughs> then I would like to introduce Claudia Menon, and she's also a colleague of mine, but in a different perspective. Uh, Claudia is CFO of Brand Loyalty and had a very distinguished career as uh, CFO in many uh, important uh, uh, firms. 
But Claudia is also a colleague of mine because she is in the supervisory board of the Efteling BV. <laughs> very important. And, a very and, nice, uh, uh, huh? and it's also very nice. Eh? And very nice. It's not like a fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we have to make money sometimes. So some people have to take uh, notice of the money. Yeah. Uh, and she is also in the audit committee. Uh, my uh, function is that different because I'm in the Stichtingsbestuur Natuurpark de Efteling, so we are the shareholder, the only and unique shareholder. I do the money there, yeah. Yeah, so I'm the vice chairman. And we, of course, we have a very special governance uh, structure with the executive board, with the supervisory board, and I would say the Stichting, the foundation. Uh, it's almost like we are family business, but we are not family of each other. That's the only difference. Uh, so here we are with this fantastic panel. Uh, and first of all, I would like to give the floor to uh, Corinne and Claudia for their first reaction on a victor's speech. Uh, Corinne, may I ask you? Okay, thanks, Vic. Uh, thanks, Victor. Thanks, yeah. Sylvester. Um, and thanks, Victor, for a wonderful and truly inspiring uh, presentation. I haven't read your book yet, uh, but that's to come. Um, yes, um, what struck me, what inspires me, what, what motivates me in your presentation? Of course, that's thinking of you as well as Dick driving the same car, but not together. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And then... Um, that's an illustration of, of a question I have and a, and a point I would like to make is, uh, you argue that from data, with data, um, more quantity, um, more quality in choice. Uh, in between data and choice, there's judgment. Um, and one of the issues that came to my mind is in judging driving a car and uh, perhaps you know the well-known um, audio on the internet that can be found of a self-driving car in a situation where it um, almost bumps into the front car and you have to make in a split second a decision whether you move to the right or to the left uh, or you put your brakes and in on the right there is a motorcyclist on the left there is a huge um, a very fortified car, what do you do? Do you move to the right where you're less vulnerable? Do you move to the left where you're more vulnerable? Uh, in other words, that's a judgment to make. Um, I don't know whether Dick or you make a different judgment, but, but judgments are crucial in, com in coming from data to choice. Um, so a first reflection I had during your presentation, what exactly do you mean with data? Um, what exactly do we mean as a society, as, as using data, as thinking about progressive data sharing markets? What is data? It's no longer the simple data that used to be. It's partly judgment. But it's not judgment in the full-fledged manner that we as humans judge. Um, or perhaps that might be. So. Um, Trust and responsibility, one of the, your, your final uh, um, observations, makes me think of what is data. What is data related to judgment in um, ending up with choice? So that's the first part. Um, I don't know, Sylvester, how long, well, how many minutes? Well, you're almost at the end. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> because we, 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 we truly want to make this interactive. Yeah, no, so, yes, uh, let that's me, um, I think, yeah, let me, let me put it for this. I have yeah, one other comment, but that could be later. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Corrie. Uh, first reaction by Claudia. Yeah. Um, what I realized, I actually went, I, I came halfway through your book uh, because I only got it yesterday, but uh, I'm, uh, what I realized reading the book and thinking about what you were going to say and what I heard you say today is that we as companies, uh, and then I, I see myself as, the re I think, the representative of the companies, I think, is we have an enormous challenge because these, these mega firms are, uh, are coming up. They are basically 
because they have the platform or these enormous markets uh, uh, with data rich markets. Uh, they have it, uh, and what are we as traditional companies going to do about that? And I think we as brand loyalty, but also I think a lot of people are thinking, how should we do that? And I think the only answer to that is innovate, innovate, and innovate, uh, because that's the only way to compete, I think, in this, in, this, in this world, which is for me very important. But what I also hear you say is that the traditional way of looking at things changes. And for me as CFO, that means I cannot be cost focused anymore, but I need to start looking at uh, innovation. And I also need to uh, steer the organization differently uh, and making sure that people also start looking with, with different glasses at, uh, at how we as a, as a, as a company uh, have continuity and how we, how we grow, keep growing as a, as a company. But what I also see is that there's a, uh, so I see a lot of challenges ahead, but I also see a lot of opportunity actually uh, for us as, uh, well, we are in, in the consumer space, but for us as consumers in this big data, you were talking about uh, personalized medication. Uh, well, I think it's also nice when you walk into a store and you feel uh, that people, you're recognized and you're being treated as, as, as people know you. So I think stores will become much more of an experience and it's really nice that, that the, the data helps to personalize things and you're really recognized as a consumer. So I think I also see huge opportunity for us as people to, in, in big data and being recognized. Uh, and then it all comes down to trust. Can we trust the person who's handling our data? Because I'm really willing to share it. Mm -hmm. Can we trust the person who's handling our data with our data? And I think that's uh, also a big responsibility of all of us to make sure that that happens. So, but that's, I think, my reflection on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Victor, you, do you want to respond to these uh, first reactions? Uh, yes, I, I, let me uh, take a, m a moment to, um, to reflect on that. Uh, thank you very much both uh, for, your, for your comments. I, in, in the book, we write quite a bit about the need for augmenting reporting uh, lines inside organizations to, in, to improve the richness and the comprehensiveness of data far beyond the classical accounting and reporting that is being done uh, today. So I, I, I fully and full-heartedly agree with that. Uh, Corinne, with respect to the, the you, two questions that you posed, one was, uh, what's data? And I get quite worked up about this um, because I, I think that we should not mythologize the definition of what data is or isn't. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, to quote Shannon and Weaver, their seminal paper, um, data is any meaningful signal. And that's a pretty good, but also pretty minimal um, definition uh, in the sense that, um, you know, is there a difference between raw data and curated data and judgment data and all these kind of, at the end of the day, I think that when we start differentiating there, we don't, we, I can't see much of improving the process. I think that the way by which we need to focus on improving the process or making sure that we don't make any mistakes, we need to start at a different level or a different layer. Um, and to me that is and has to do with uh, the role of the humans as decision makers or as judge, ju jurors, if you want, judges. Um, and to me that is one of those fundamental ideas or fundamental elements of a human right in the 21st century, uh, namely that humans retain their liberty to decide for themselves whether they want to decide or whether they want to delegate a decision to some other decision assistant. In other words, um, the, the danger that I see is that, for example, our healthcare system will be so good in data that it will come to me and say, Victor, I know that you really like red meat, but it's really not good for your health, so you better not eat red meat anymore. And then 
I am worried that this sort of reduces dramatically my freedom of decision making, my human volition. And so I want to make sure that we retain the liberty, we humans retain, we as individuals, not the collective, but the individual retains the liberty to decide, even to decide irrationally and to decide crazily um, if we want to. Um, and at the same time, we need to educate our children. I think that's one of those very important cultural skills of the future. To, to make choices about who they want to, want to make decisions, themselves or some delegated assistant or so forth. Because that is where liberty, I think, in the future will be gained or lost. Can yes, I interrupt, yes, given it's interactive? Of course, of course. Um, I fully agree. Um, um, but to say, to put the normative um, aspect to the side, um, if data becomes money, becomes value, I mean, uh, the, the European regulatory framework on consumer protection, you can pay with your data instead of with money, uh, old-fashioned money. Then I'm wondering what, what equivalent um, uh, do I relate data to? I mean, money is euros, rubles, um, etc. So the value of a currency. But, but that don't, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking what how do you relate data to value then? And isn't that, at that point, you need to distinguish between different sorts and types of data because it represents value. And if we equate it with a currency, then you would like to know the value of a currency. Yes, and I don't think that data is going to be a very widespread currency. Um, it, precisely because of the quality you just, um, you just described. Um, when we develop money, uh, and uh, economists and business uh, professors uh, remember that, when we develop money in a way, um, we first had something that was inherently valuable in itself for one reason or another, whether it was a, a fur, a piece of fur, or something that we exchanged. Um, but over time, we move to fiat money. That is something that is inherently not valuable. A piece of paper is inherently not valuable. It just is valuable because of the attributes that it comes with it, but the thing is not valuable. And that is a good thing for money. We want something that is inherently not valuable because then the value is on the, in the attribution. Now, the, the, the worry that I have is that if we move towards data being currency, then we have something that is inherently valuable being also a means of payment. And that is confusing two functions with each other. That's quite abstract now, but that, uh, and I apologize for it, but it's, uh, uh, um, but, but it's why I am so um, hesitant to sort of see data um, as, a, as, as a replacement of money beyond certain niche areas. It's a, re it's a replacement of the function of money as informing markets, but it's not a replacement for the payment function of money in many areas. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Dick, first reaction on the um, lecture, and then we go to okay. the plenary discussion. Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, um, many thanks for this very interesting uh, uh, talk. And I've heard some talks already, but uh, again, new elements uh, in it. So many thanks for that. Um, so my reaction is also uh, a reaction of, an, uh, of a nerd, of somebody who is really in the, uh, in the heart of uh, data science. Um, because you were talking about data as um, had a new currency, data economy. Um, and I think we all agree that data is a very important and valuable resource. Um, but what is the role of algorithms? And um, so I was thinking about it, and um, is that maybe not more important even than, than data? And maybe also in the future, um, becoming more and more important, um, because I think we will also see a trend that data is shared more and more. And then I think finally the value of a company is in the algorithms that they uh, develop. And I think then also maybe yeah, a market of uh, algorithms will um, 
uh, come up where everybody is selling and buying pieces of code, smart algorithms, um, and that's becoming more and more important. Um, and also, if you see at many applications um, nowadays, then um, sometimes you know even it's not big data that is used. But really the secret is, is in what I call the big search space, mm -hmm. where you really want to find the best solution out of an, an enormous amount of possibilities. Mm. And if you do it just with a computer um, in a stupid way, then you, you need thousands of years. <coughs> but with smart um, artificial intelligence or optimization algorithms, you can really find the, the, the best solution. Um, so, um, that's in fact my, my reaction. I think, in my opinion, algorithms will become even more important than data. And of course we need data, like uh, oxygen, um, but algorithms is more important. Yeah, first um, answer and then we go so to the plenary. So, um, I don't disagree with you. It's never good to disagree <laughs> with any of you. <laughs> Because you are right, uh, not because uh, I want to be friendly. Um, I, see it, I see a slightly different nuance, and that is that um, in, in the, the book that Ken and I did uh, on big data, we described the, the power of algorithms, and we called for algorithmic uh, accountability and algorithmic account uh, accountancy and algorithmic transparency. We even called for algorithmists, a new profession mm -hmm. that would look at algorithms that they show that they're okay and that they're not biased in one form or another. Uh, five years later, I think we got it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and we got it wrong because when we look at how data-driven machine learning works, the actual algorithm only exists for a very short snapshot of time because the machine learning system changes the algorithm based on new feedback data that comes in constantly. Mm -hmm. So to me, the specific algorithm isn't so valuable. But the meta algorithm, that is the machine that takes data and then translates it into algorithm that it constantly adapts based on new feedback, that kind of a system mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable and an incredibly interesting differentiator. At this point in time, thanks to the market concentrations that we have, most differentiation in the market is based on data that is based on raw material. That's terrible. That's particularly terrible for innovation because we want innovation on the meta algorithms. We want innovation in machine learning. Mm -hmm. And if all the, the current differentiator is data and how I get more data than you get, then I don't focus enough on the machine, on improving machine and enhancing machine learning systems. So in that sense, that's one of the reasons why we push for the progressive data sharing mandate, because then the data becomes less important. It becomes wider spread, as you suggested. Um, more companies have the data. And then in order to differentiate themselves, they need to invest more in the metadata, uh, in the meta algorithms, in the, in the machine learning systems. Were the real differentiation, I agree with you, is to be had. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so we go now to the more interactive part, uh, which uh, Oswald announced. Uh, and that more interactive part has two components. If you look to the interview uh, Victor gave in Buitenhof, but also in the Financiële Dagblad, uh, it's clear what his words uh, is about the superstar firms. Uh, GAVAs, uh, so Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and you can add Alibaba, uh, whatever. What is the monopoly power of these GAVAs, of these superstar forms, and what does it mean for society? How do we deal with that? Should we go to regulation, or should we uh, get uh, 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 startups who challenge these GAVAs or not? So this is a serious problem, not only for the organization of our firms and our marketplaces, but also for society. So what I would like to ask people from the audience to uh, ask their questions uh, related to this topic, 
And then we do that in an orderly way, eh, as uh, we do that normally, uh, that you stand up, you say who you are, and maybe also which position, which function, which firm you represent, and uh, you end your question with a question mark. Eh? <laughs> uh, so we don't need <laughs> testimonies, <laughs> we ask questions with a question mark at the end. And then maybe you could also ask which person of which persons in the panel you would address this question. So who uh, may I ask to ask the first question? The gentleman there. You have to wait till the microphone is there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Wim Luttgerink, uh, simple social psychologist. Uh, I, I'm asking myself, what will it mean to the average uh, citizen? Um, will he be lazy? Will he be uh, a new slave? Is it slavery of all what's coming to him? Or mm -hmm. is there some uh, way to, uh, to deal with it? Okay, clear question, thank you. Victor, maybe? Slave or not? <laughs> <laughs> Master, something in between. Yes, um, something in between. <laughs> um, <sighs> to me, there is no easy, no easy overall answer to it, um, because it will mean different things for different people. I'm afraid, and I use, I'm afraid, with much trepidation. One of the, the worries that I have is not just about distributional issues, that is, who is getting the money. I'm more worried about what is the role of individuals in this society when employment not only may go away in some sectors, but when employment itself changes. That is, some jobs may go away, some jobs may start, but for the, for the truck driver uh, that, whose job is taken over by the autonomous driving truck, it doesn't help very much to tell him or to tell her that there is a job available as a nurse in the hospital uh, or as a PHP programmer uh, in the IT shop down the road. So th in other words, we need a massive reskilling of certain areas of our, uh, of our labor force. That is a huge challenge. And a lot of people will feel that they are the losers of this development, like a lot of people felt that they were the losers of the Industrial yeah. Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have a, a society and a, and a system of government called democracy mm -hmm. that turns out to be much more brittle uh, than we thought it would be. We thought it was extremely robust and so forth, and now we discover actually that there is quite some brittleness in the mm -hmm. system. And so we are facing these challenges, so I worry how can we as a democracy um, master these challenges in a way that it, that it doesn't create massive upheaval in our society. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, I'm not convinced we can do that you know, I, sometimes I'm an optimist, sometimes I'm a pessimist. But we need to look at the reality of what is going to happen. And that means different things for different people. If everybody would be 10% worse off, if everybody would be enslaved, I actually then would be able to start a revolution. <laughs> that would be relatively straightforward. Yeah. The problem is, it's different for different people, mm -hmm. and that means the answer to that problem requires much more uh, differentiation uh, than a simple, let's stop it. Yeah, but of course, we are all worried about, we saw the labor share, kept the market share, we saw the profits. Uh, we forgot to mention the fact that these GAVAs don't pay so much so, ma so much taxes. Absolutely, and then there is That's this problem, president, eh? this American cop, don't That's get me started, this American <laughs> president out there who is sort of celebrating the fact that 
that Apple has now decided to repatriate unpaid tax profits, right? So Apple is said to repatriate about 278 billion US dollars, okay? And you know what, how much taxes they are supposed to pay? If they had paid it, normally an American tax bracket, corporate tax rate, 40%, right? Mm -hmm. You know what they negotiated? 15%. Yeah, yeah. So Trump says, victory. I look at it and I said, you just lost 25% tax rate. You just lost more than half of $278 billion. You just cheated the American taxpayer out of about 160 billion US dollars. Gotcha. Thank you very much, Mr. Trump. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <clears throat> actually, actually, I had a discussion in Sintra last uh, uh, the, the ECB uh, forum with Ho Farian, who is the chief economist of uh, Google, and that was at the day that Google received uh, a fine of 2.7 billion of the European Commission. And I asked him, uh, is there a relation between your tax evasion and perhaps the fact that the European Commission gives you this, these fines? Of course, he denied it, but there is a relation because we know what proper taxes are. And so we have an idea what you should pay as a citizen, as a firm. And if you don't, if you optimize taxes, as they call that, then of course there is, in the sense of equity, a problem. Uh, but anyhow, uh, other panel members who want to have a reaction to this slave or master. Nobody? Okay. Good. We go to the next question. Thank you. My name is Janneke Tsenkova, Tilburg Law School, and um, Outreaching uh, Program Director. Thank you to the Friend of Copenhagen, our biggest uh, sponsor. Um, my question relates actually to, your, uh, to this tax issue uh, of how do we deal with, um, with all those companies. And I was wondering, do you think that it might be a good idea in view of also what's going on right now um, in the United States to actually give private enforcement an important role in dealing with those companies and uh, giving private individuals um, the, the right to, um, um, to undertake civil actions? And in, um, I'm saying that because I know that in the US and Europe we have different views on that. Um, but maybe, maybe that is a way to, um, to have some checks and balances over there to not get in that situation. Okay, Thank you. clear. Victor and then other panel, panel members if they want. So clear. I have a very controversial answer to that. Um, the, the, let me try to restate the question ever so slightly. Today, or yet, was it yesterday, Max Schrems lost his court battle uh, against Facebook. He tried to have a... Uh, um, uh, collective action uh, before the courts, um, not just representing himself, but lots of similar uh, class action, sorry, a class action uh, before the courts, and he failed. Um, in Europe, currently, when it comes to data protection and privacy, but a number of other consumer rights as well, we hope that individuals will go to court to fight for their rights. Now, that sounds wonderful, and I have been writing about this and advocating it for many years. But the truth is, individuals don't. The truth is we all click OK, <laughs> most of us, without reading. And so I have become incredibly dissatisfied and disillusioned with an individual rights regime that pretends that we have rights, but that, in effect, doesn't give us protection. And so I want a data protection and privacy regime that actually gives us accountability and responsibility irrespective of the existence of Max Schrems. Um, and, and, and so I want to actually collectivize data protection. That is, I want a government regulatory agency to check up on data users and make sure that they don't misuse data irrespective of whether we find an individual who is willing to sue 
the large gaffers or any other, anybody else. Because I think that against those large organizations, <laughs> an individual has all disincentives to go battle against. And so we need, as a society, to step up to the plate. We have done that before when we think about car safety in the 1960s. Ralph Nader went to court first because there didn't exist any of the collective regulatory systems, but then we put in place regulatory systems for car safety that don't rely on Ralph Nader anymore asking for seat belts but that require that new cars are being tested mm -hmm. and if they topple over like the smart car did a few years back or the Mercedes A-Class, then it cannot be solved but need to be re-engineered. And we need the same kind of ex-ante regulatory uh, setup, I think, with sensitive data use as well. Thanks. Corinne? Very briefly, I fully agree. I think that um, we have to step towards a different era in enforcement because mm -hmm. uh, you can no longer expect from us individuals to uphold their rights, our rights. So um, um, I've argued in, in, in different publications that we need to step towards a more enforcement by government more and new instruments. But one additional remark there, I think that we also have to introduce mechanisms, and I think there's an interesting example in Germany, that companies can sue other companies mm -hmm. for unfair, um, um, well, for now unfair competition, yeah, yeah. but that um, uh, within the market there should be also be instruments to um, um, put your competitor in, in the right spot as regards how to use data and be responsible as regards to use of data. So in between yeah. companies, I think that also yeah. there's um, much to do yeah. in um, better enforcement and uh, providing companies for a mechanism to there. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how, how that would work in practice, I think, whether yeah. companies would really start uh, suing each other. But I, I completely agree. But also from a company perspective, I think it's also clearer when there's, more, there, when there's government enforcement around mm -hmm. data protection, because otherwise, uh, you're operating in an environment exactly. that's also less predictable, I think, for mm -hmm. a company. So I think, this, yeah, yeah, I would really encourage uh, that. Okay, and I think in the world of advertisement and um, uh, means being used by company A in, mm -hmm. in, uh, as regards advertisement, the company mm -hmm. B can sue um, for misleading advertisement, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. So companies can sue one another in different mm -hmm. areas. And by way of example, they, uh, we, could, we could think of um, similar instruments with respect yeah. to data. Yeah, I know the question is whether I would, when I would say, for example, my competitor is not handling the data well enough, or when I would say that how my clients would look at me, I think would be... Uh, but unfair but use of data, yeah, yeah. unfair um, given what they um, uh, say to um, us consumers and what they're doing, and um, not acting in accordance with that, you can... Yeah in between companies uh, sue for misleading behavior. Dick, maybe? No? No? Okay. Okay, uh, clear. We go to the second part, because we have limited time, although uh, the, the moderator ch uh, determines how limited that is, of course. Uh, it's a second part, and that's also already discussed uh, in uh, Victor's uh, speech and uh, also in his interviews, um, that's about the next step. The next step, big data, but the next step is artificial intelligence. Was that, was a, does that mean? And we are encountering a new era of, you know, automation, where, you know, and what is artificial intelligence? I should define it, of course, because everybody has a different definition. Uh, artificial intelligence, you can simply say that's machine learning, that's one. Uh, I think there's three elements, uh, autonomous, non-biological learning. Those three <coughs> elements, I think, are uh, the, the key elements of artificial intelligence. A very good report, uh, which was published by the Rand Corporation uh, more than a month ago, a survey where you see all the elements for cybersecurity, but also for employment. Very interesting, very important. It's also in The Economist discussed uh, this last week, uh, not only about the titles, but also about what does it mean for our society. Uh, so I would like to ask people from uh, the audience whether they have a question, 
which is related to artificial intelligence and, of course, the implications for, for society in economic growth, employment, social cohesion, all the elements, all the dimensions, not only economic, but also social and also legal. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anna, and currently I'm studying master in global communication. Mm -hmm. And first of all, thank you, Mr. Victor, for a very inspiring um, uh, presentation. And I have a, uh, one question for uh, you. Is like, um, there is no doubt that big data is very important in our, uh, in our life, daily life a day, nowadays, but uh, keeping it between like qualitative data and qualitative data is also very difficult. And from po your point of view, what you gonna do to keep it like keeping the balance between that to make sure that people is not being a slaver of the machine? Yeah, that is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I take your question also to, to focus on uh, the, the tendency that we have of quantifying so much about ourselves uh, and then therefore focusing only on what can be quantified rather than not on what cannot be quantified and need to be captured qualitatively. Um, I, I think that is a danger. Um, now, that was a danger particularly in the small data world where it was so hard to capture um, quantitatively. Uh, many elements. It's getting a little easier, but I fully agree with you that we need to be careful that we are, that we don't think that this is a magical black box. Uh, throw something in and then crank the handle and then the solution will come out. There will be mistakes, there will be errors, there will be difficulties, and there will be a need to interpret. There's a wonderful case. Uh, Microsoft, a few years back, bought a very large software producer for um, hospital software, uh, hospital healthcare management software in hospitals that captured lots of health data of individuals. And they did uh, a data analysis there, lots of data, and they discovered that uh, a particular surgeon uh, was an uh, older male, uh, had a disproportionate number of people dying on the surgical table uh, at surgeries. And so they said, ha, now we have a problem and we have identified the problem. We need to take a conversation, have a conversation with this gentleman and then take him out of the system. He was actually the head of the department <laughs> doing the most difficult surgeries. And so what was not captured in the data was actually that he did the high-risk surgeries. And of course he had a higher failure rate because this was sort of at the, if you want, at the cutting edge, there nobody else wanted to touch it anymore. And so if you don't have that interpretative context, you make a mistake in interpreting what you see. And so we need to be aware of the limitations uh, and, uh, and we need to understand and to learn from each other. Uh, I have uh, had the great pleasure just the last 20 minutes to learn from my panelists here, uh, from uh, what Corinne said in particular about what the Germans do uh, with respect to giving companies a right to sue other companies. I think we need to continue and, if anything, increase uh, this ability of ours to learn and to understand data and data results in context. Dick, maybe adding something? Yeah, so I, I would like to add that um, I think um, it's also important to look, uh, maybe we can um, apply uh, these techniques to certain um, applications, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe we should also think about, um, should we really do that? Um, so not only thinking about, um, are the results mm -hmm. good? Uh, can we also validate uh, uh, that? Um, but also, um, is it ethical uh, mm -hmm. to do this? Uh, and the second, um, what I would like to add is, um, I think transparency is also very in, in important, such that what comes out of it, and um, especially if we have decisions co coming out of that, that's transparent. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think there there's also a uh, methodological um, challenge to change in such a way that it becomes mm -hmm. more transparent. Yeah. No black box. No black box, yeah. yeah. Corinne, Claudia, you want to add something? Okay. We go to the next question. Hi, my name is Agatha Chmiel. I'm a social scientist and a lawyer in the making. Um, I was wondering if perhaps you would have a comment on the, let's say, transcendence of or correlation between the digital society that we're talking about right now, but also the globalizing society that we're, we're still very much at and that process has definitely not ended yet in terms of opportunities that digital era and with the help of AI could perhaps help with the improved inclusion of globalized society. In other words, what are the opportunities for an AI doctor serving Amsterdam or London patients? Yeah, being well, also you put the question mark now, eh? Yeah, yeah. To, to put, to help Ugandan or Uruguayan patients at the same, at the same time. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Victor? Uh, I'm, when, when I look at the have and the have nots, um, then I am much more optimistic on a global scale, that is on a sort of country versus country scale. Um, and I see a lot of uh, applications uh, of data analysis that actually help uh, developing economies quite significantly. Uh, and we learn a lot uh, from this data analysis. There's a phenomenal uh, case study. Um, so some of you may heard of may have heard of Impreza, Impreza, uh, the, uh, the, the payment solution based on SMS systems uh, in mobile phone uh, uh, contexts, uh, particularly in Kenya, but in a number of other uh, uh, African countries. A a and it's very empowering, of course, as, a, as, a, as an app, but it also creates data. And they did data <laughs> analysis on the data. And what is amazing is that because of the micro level of transactions that goes on, they can see pockets of innovation and entrepreneurship um, that a, a macro level view couldn't see. And so they discovered, for example, that in some really difficult slum-like situations, there are pockets of entrepreneurship. And so, uh, you know, it would be terrible to say, oh, this is a slum, this is, we need to, uh, you know, th 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 there's no hope in there at all. When now we begin to understand on a micro level what actually is the dynamic going on there and how we can help the people living there transcend by helping some of the entrepreneurial dynamic to take hold. And so I think that these are incredibly inspiring applications. And I think that we will have an ability to use those in order to overcome some of the have, have nots <coughs> on a global scale. I am much less confident that we can do that within a nation. The, the, the issues that, we, that I talked about with respect to employment, for example. I am less confident that we have a silver bullet that helps people who have been truck drivers all their lives to then find swiftly a new work identity for them when automation takes away their jobs. Okay. Other people want to Dick? Yeah, yeah. So, um you know, I'm very enthusiastic about um, all these developments, but this mm -hmm. is really my, my fear that the difference I between know. the haves and the have-nots is becoming even more uh, bigger. But I think we have the choice to really apply these methods mm -hmm. to certain uh, applications, and I think we, can, we have the choice to also use them mm -hmm. to decrease the difference between the haves and have-nots. Um, th that's, I think, uh, uh, a positive thing, but the negative thing is that I think it has to do also with moral values. Uh, maybe I'm very old-fashioned in that, but um, and I'm not so optimistic if you're talking about moral values. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, well, that's my. Uh, you should become Catholic then, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we have more hope. Yeah? You know, the Protestants. <laughs> well, anyhow, <laughs> Claudia. No, I think I, I, I agree with uh, with most of what has been said. I think. Uh, 
what what di this difference between the haves and the have nots is, I think, is is also from a political perspective uh, a risk that you get a lot of. Uh, well, you get the rise of the populism, and you see all these differences. And I think if we don't solve this difference between haves and have nots, we have a real issue as society. And I think the governments are not quick enough at solving that. So it should really come from all of us. Mm -hmm. I think to have a good solution for that. But I I don't have it either. But I think together we can we can do that. Okay, Corinne. Um, I, I'm, no, let me put it differently. I'm, uh, I sometimes try to live without the, um, what, what, how did you call the companies, the uh, super? Stars. Super firms. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I try to Gathers. live without them. Uh, not so much for reasons of privacy, because, but as an, uh, as an uh, academic and scientific experiment. How far can you get without Google, Facebook, uh, etc.? And uh, the leeway for me becomes much more narrow during mm -hmm. the years. Not, not only because I do not want to participate, but also because I cannot use certain services without participating. And um, I'm not so much worried about business-related uh, services, but more and more the government uses these five companies for its services. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to uh, uh, use um, uh, services from uh, public broadcasting, certain government um, uh, organizations, I need to enroll in Facebook mm -hmm. um, and list up. Um, so what, what, be, what then becomes reality is that Facebook becomes an identifier. Mm -hmm. It becomes an identifier for certain services. Also, um, um, uh, services um, being financed with public money. So, um, in doing an experiment, living, mm. trying to live without those super companies, that's becoming more and more difficult. So, in um, whereas I also see the fantastic opportunities. So, let me make myself clear: I'm I'm not against the, the different applications, but I'm I'm trying to retain a bit autonomous mm -hmm. in um, opting yes to use them and use the wonderful opportunities and not opting for those where I feel a bit more uncomfortable among others because I do not know what happens with data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clear. Well, this also this uh, perspective for us from educational institutions, huh? so it has a meaning for our students. Huh? students in our audience, uh, students who study here or other universities, where we have to make the next step to algorithms, so legal tech, audit tech, finance, financial fin fintech, where you see that employment is important, for employment in the future it's important to be adaptable. Adaptable in the sense that you not only combine your profession, finance, audit, legal, but also with algorithms. So my last question to you is, how do you see that? How do you see the uh, adaptability of the younger generations in that, and what should they do? Victor? You always have those simple questions. Yes. Uh, very simple. <laughs> um, So as I grow old, I become less adaptable. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. It's a fact of life. It's true. I would never have thought it. I thought that I was incredibly adaptable when I was young. The truth is I am not less. I'm mar far, more, uh, far less adaptable, far more uh, rigid now than I've been. So in that sense, just because people are young, they're also more adaptable to start with. To me, the question is less about adaptability than more about the role of what kind of preparation, what kind of skills, what kind of things do we as education, mm -hmm. educators mm -hmm. need to give them so mm -hmm. that they can be successful in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. And over the last couple of years, I have come convinced, but maybe I'm completely wrong, but I have come be convinced that we need to stress far more than we do today 
not necessarily our adaptability, but our focus on creativity, on originality, on uh, having crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that is one of the redeeming capabilities of us human beings, uh, at least until machine learning tells me otherwise. Um, and so if that's the case, then I tell my eight-year-old not necessarily to learn phone numbers by heart. You know, I'm told that it's terrible, but told by some people it's terrible that we don't know phone numbers by heart anymore. Well, I don't think that's terrible at all. I think that that was a useless usage of our brain's power. And so it's good that this is going away. Um, but but I, rather than learning phone numbers by heart, I want my son to use the digital tools in a creative fashion to give him the space also to put the digital tool aside and to do something crazy with paper, with wood, with, uh, with snow right now mm -hmm. in Austria, where he is right now, uh, to just experiment mm -hmm. uh, with life and with what is out there. Because I think that that is where creativity is being fostered and that will prepare him well for the future. Whether I am right or not, ask me in 30 years if I'm still around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Something to add briefly, yeah. yes, and then we close. So adaptability is very important, of course, because we now educate students and uh, for jobs that uh, don't exist now. Mm -hmm. um, so I fully agree, <laughs> creativity is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm also very glad and it's not an advertisement for this university, but that we have kennis, kunde, character, knowledge, skills, and uh, character. Mm -hmm. And especially the last one, and mm -hmm. I think also that one is very uh, important. Eh? Mm -hmm. Coming back to the discussion, mm -hmm. maybe it's my, that's okay. my stock page, uh, but mm -hmm. I'd like to say it again. Uh, also in this respect, mm -hmm. I think uh, we can do a lot uh, there. And you know, it's amazing. If I talk to the young uh, students, and if I tell them that they can really do meaningful uh, work and jobs later, uh, that is very inspiring mm -hmm. for them, and that is, uh, that really inspired them. Claudia? Uh, nothing to add, I think. Uh, well, Corinne? Um, trust and responsibility, that's two key words with, with, what you, uh, with which you ended. And I, um, to me, um, learning the younger generation, the new generation, is learning what does trust and responsibility mean in relation to a new world. So it's not so much that we have to learn them to use technology, they learn it themselves. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean, trust and responsibility in relation to data? So. Okay, uh, a big hand for the panel. Uh, first, I go uh, to thank first the panel members and you as last because you get a special uh, present. Okay. First of all, uh, Corinne, please. <coughs> Flowers and a kiss. <laughs> Thank you. Claudia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dick. Also flowers. No kiss. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And Victor. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. It was great. Don't I get a kiss? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. That's, uh, uh, that's not... Uh, Thank you. Please, Thank you please. very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And then it's my honor to give the floor again back to Oswald Koene, the chairman of the Vriendenhof Kopenhagen for the scholarship and prize. Thank you, Sylvester. Um, yes, well, once again, also on behalf of the Vrienden van Kopenhagen, thank you very much for your contribution, especially uh, Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger. Thank you very much. I think it's very inspiring and also still a subject which needs a lot of thought for the coming years. But we will see. Well, and we will come to the, the last part of this afternoon. That is, uh, it's a great honor for me that we uh, 
like for the second time to award the so-called scholarships and prize. And maybe it's good before I give the floor to one of our friends, Nike, and uh, which is also part, uh, has been member of the jury to uh, make a selection who will win. Maybe it's good that I give a short introduction why we have this. Because we, uh, once again, we like to be, uh, being alumni of this university, be very much connected to the existing students. Because they are the next generation, and hopefully they will be your the next generation friends. So by doing that, by giving awards, we try to have a better uh, well, visibility among current students. Secondly, we don't want to give this prize because it's only for academic performance, because we are not the institute for that, that's the university related to that. But we believe that we can give an award to certain students which bring something extra during their student life, societal, societal relevance. So that's the reason why we have introduced those awards, both for bachelor and master students, and we believe that the winners show somehow uh, more than average engagement with the great challenges facing us today and also are actively engaged in society in order to find solutions for those challenges because we believe that's what is unique about Tilburg University and where we as alumni can contribute that. So we like to uh, enable excellent young people to further develop themselves based, uh, partly based on the award they will get. Well, by doing that, I'd like to give the floor to Nika Martens, one of our alumni, also a friend of Copenhagen, and she has been one of our leading uh, members of the jury to introduce the students which have been nominated, and then finally to, uh, well, to make the decision, uh, to uh, announce the decision. Nika. Yeah, thank you, Oswald. And um, for me, it's a real pleasure to stand here. Uh, for, and it's actually, it always, always reminds me uh, of the days when I was a student. I, start, I studied here in 1991, a long time ago. And I actually, before I start with the, um, let's say, with the prizes, um, I would like to share one thought with all the students that are here. Because to me, I also stand here as a very proud alumnus of Tilburg University. And today is for me one of the signals that you chose the right university to study. Because the, today's topic is really one of the topics that we need to discuss and where we need to exchange different views in order to advance society. And I stand here as, a, as an alumnus of Tilburg University, but of course I also have a, a job besides that. And my job is to um, actually transform, or I'm responsible for the digital transformation at Rabobank. And actually, I just learned from, um, from our keynote speaker, Victor, that I need to be fast at that uh, because at, uh, in 10 years' time, I will not have a job anymore because banks will no longer exist. <laughs> but actually, besides joking about that, um, I really want to share with you one more thing, and that is that um, the book that we have been learning a lot about today is actually been read by the whole executive board of Rabobank already, and they were very, very, very jealous that I was here today. And they had asked me, how did you manage? How did you manage? How did you do that? And I said, well, the answer is very simple. You just have to study at Tilburg University. <laughs> so. And then um, the jury. And uh, actually, I realized, um, Oswald, it's actually we have a small problem because we, um, the jury uh, exists uh, of very wise men and women, but we did not base our decision on data. So next year we have to, uh, we have to, <laughs> we have to change that. Frederik, I also see you. Yeah, we, have to, uh, we have to change that. And um, I also want to share with you that um, this year it has been really, really tough because we changed the criteria, like Oswald just said, so we look at academic excellence, so at least uh, 7.5 grade on average, which is already quite an achievement, but we also really look at how relevant are you for society and how engaged are you in or at society. And when I looked at all the contributions, um, I got very optimistic because I thought, wow, we have so many talents here and uh, people and students who are very uh, optimistic about the chances and about the solutions, very creative solutions. So I'm sure that you know, we will be advancing society over time. 
And then I would like to share with you um, a number of the, um, or who are the, who are the students that um, submitted their ideas. And we thought, well, instead of giving you the academic uh, research, we will share some quotes with you. So I will actually start with the, oh, thanks. That's, that's very uh, convenient. Um, the, with the nominees for the scholarship. And Ilaria, uh, she said it very nice, nicely. If an opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. Well, talking about creativity. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie Melgers. I don't know, I, I'm sure every one of you is um, familiar with Pippi Lankaus. I'm reading it to my boys every, uh, every day. I've never, I will say it in Dutch, ik heb het nog nooit gedaan, dus ik denk dat ik het wel kan. Hartstikke mooie, or very nice attitude. A student I've just met this afternoon, Kaliopi Kiriaki. A longer quote, but very important as well. Learning classes from teachers, classmates and books. Explore and experience the world with your senses and gut. Combine the knowledge you gain and share it in order to build actual solutions for those who need them and provide answers to those who ask intriguing questions, progressing yourself and the world, advancing society. Adrian, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Kobbenhagen could have said it himself. <laughs> and then the real tough part. The winner is Sophie Melgers. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. First, going to explain okay. why. Yeah? Um, and actually, I was supposed to do that and then invite you, but I thought it's much nicer to give you the compliments yourself. So, standing, uh, standing beside me. Uh, Sophie, um, Sophie has really done uh, a lot. And um, what I think is really good is that uh, you got your inspiration from um, the Arab Spring and the financial uh, crisis. And they happened when you were a teenager. Uh, I was already at work, so that's, <laughs> that's the difference, uh, one of the differences uh, between us. And what you, um, you looked at what happened and you thought what we need is different perspectives. So if we really want to understand what happens, we need different perspectives so that we understand each other and also can come to a solution. And what you did is you, uh, you started by studying psychology and, and maybe you, you met Victor at Harvard, I don't know, but it could have been, uh, it could have been possible. Um, and then you, um, then you continued your studies at international law. Very nice combination of the, of the two. And you also, um, you also have an idea about uh, your scholarship. And I can tell that, but I think it's, very, <laughs> it's much nicer when you tell that yourself. Yeah, so for years now, China has really been interesting me. Yeah. Um, not because it has played a huge pot, uh, part um, on the front stage, on the main stage, but it's always been, it, China's always been this sort of creeping big force coming up slowly but surely. Um, so I plan, if possible, and I think that now is possible, uh, to study Chinese law in Hong Kong, Ch uh, Chinese state law, Chinese business law, then come back to the Netherlands in order to help build a bridge between the EU and China, but the Netherlands and China specifically. Wow. So. Yeah. I would also like to share with you and the audience what your professor told about you. And I will quote this because it's so nice that I don't, do not want to forget a single word. Sophie is not only an ambitious and talented student, but she, she is also very engaging and intelligent in class discussions. Well, once again, congratulations and uh, off <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, but we are not there yet. Because now we, are, uh, we have the second group, and that, uh, that's the Vrienden van Copenhagen Prize. And I hope this goes... Yeah. Victor. Victor is very to the point. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Very important, not always to, to be very rational. Thank you. And then Louisa Decker. Just dump in the deep and start swimming. Just do it. Very nice. And the winner is, and I will do it in a different, or actually I will do it in the same way. Um, the winner is Louisa Decker. So Louisa. What I would like to share with you about Louisa is that Louisa has a real nose, I would say, for trends in society. And Louisa uh, wrote her thesis about a topic that, is, that will actually definitely attract um, the attention of all men in the room. And I see quite a few, so that's, uh, that's good. Your thesis went, uh, was about um, sexuality amongst uh, students. And uh, I read in the uh, article that was written about it in the uh, universe uh, that uh, the word sex uh, was um, or came back 20, 296 times. So actually quite a, con well, quite a different topic, I would say, for a thesis. But the fact that you picked up on this uh, before the Me Too campaign, uh, wow, <laughs> that, says also, that also says something about understanding society, I would, uh, I would say. So really, really, um, yeah, really, really nice. Um, and we also looked at uh, what are you doing besides your uh, study. You have been very active in your uh, student association. Very, very nice. And you've been organizing uh, various international tours uh, and events. So you've been a very active uh, student. Um, and I would like to share, or to share with you and the audience also what your professor, professor told us about you. It's also a real compliment. So really let's try to listen. Once in a while, a lecturer, one, one, uh, a lecturer encounters a student who, from the start, is, is showing a, cert, a certain seriousness and an extraordinary sense of responsibility for and engagement with or his or her surroundings. And such a student are you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. To, uh, I would really like to thank all students who submitted their ideas again because they were, well, we really had a hard time. Yes. So that's. Um, well, give them applause. Yeah, exactly. That's. Uh, well, thank you for your uh, very uh, important role to make a decision. That's, that's what we learned also this afternoon. The judgment finally is important, so thank you for that. Well, we come now to the closing of this uh, afternoon. We all hope that you had a very interesting, inspiring uh, lecture, including panel discussion. And of course, uh, we all hope you, uh, to, see, to see you somewhere in time on one of the other meetings of the Vrienden van Copenhagen. And uh, before, I like to uh, invite you to go for a nice drink and the Vrienden will have a dinner afterwards. I'd like to give uh, the, the, the floor to uh, Koen Becking, the president of Tilburg University, to do the official closing of this meeting. Once again, thank you for being here, and we hope to see you back soon. Koen. Thank you, Oswald. Now, that's a difficult position to be in, eh? between that lecture and the drinks. So <laughs> I'll keep it short. Um, thank you all very much on behalf of the executive board and our deans to, to be here today. Um, I really enjoyed the lecture and all the discussions. The take-home message for me is that education is key. 
Yeah, it's, it's a free interpretation of something you've said, Victor, that we have to teach the children, the next generations, to, to learn how to make decisions, to be able to decide, had them, to make them able to decide who is going to make the decisions for them or not. So I think that's, that's what we do here every day with a lot of passion and, and love, and um, you've made it even more um, interesting to me as well. So thank you all very much for being here. Because we want to reach out to the new generations, um, we really want to, to emphasize and to ask your attention for the next, uh, next year's Copenhagen lecture. And also for that reason, um, I decided not to wear a tie today, uh, just to, to, to symbolize that we reach out to all you guys. Now let's have some drinks. Thank you.